Hi everyone, welcome to my channel, Mark D. Heilong. My name is Mark Donaldson. My Chinese name is Heilong, or the Dongle means is Heilong. And today I'm just going to do a vlog that was based on the Mars rover mission, the successful mission. So um, yeah, I'm, it's pretty amazing. I'm very impressed with how they were able to successfully execute this mission. So I'm just going to show you some pictures, a panoramic picture. And from past Mars missions to this one, there are noticeable differences. Uh, one of the big differences is the quality of the images that are coming back from the, of course, the 20 megapixel cameras that are being used on the rover, the Mars Lunar Rover Perseverance. And I'm just fascinated at the surface, the equipment, the, the mechanics, uh, the resolution. And we got this information pretty much within 24 to 48 hours upon landing. So we're able to uh, digest a vast amounts more quantities of data coming from the surface of Mars than in previous missions. And I'm pretty certain that if we keep doing this, it's only going to get better. So uh, just beautiful pictures, absolutely incredible to look at the surface of another planet that is uh, just unbelievable, absolutely incredible. So I guess uh, I was trying to think of a name or topic for this video. And I thought, um, I wrote down, you know, what is the real superpower of achieving difficult things? Well, I've come to learn that it starts with a process. And the process is the scientific method. Everybody's probably learned it in elementary school, especially in high school, in say your biology class or chemistry class, and you learn the steps of the scientific method. The scientific method is probably one of the most um, powerful processes you can ever learn in your life in order to um, understand the natural world around you and to um, to exploit it for what you see for what's the resources um, energy all kinds of things related to uh, not only physical world um, to people psychology and so on so today i'm going to show you your website i'm going to zoom in here and um, this website is uh, Lumen Learning, and it covers a scientific um, method uh, based on psychology. So uh, it's pretty much the same. So the scientific method, it says here, was first outlined by Sir Francis Bacon in 1561 to 1626 to provide logical, rational problem solving across many scientific Field. So the basic steps are make an observation that describes a problem, something you have to see, the problem has to exist for you to observe it. Uh, two, create a hypothesis. Three, test that hypothesis, uh, typically in the form of some kind of make a prediction. And then four, draw a conclusion and then refine the hypothesis if your hypothesis or prediction is not accurate or what you assumed it to be. So it's based on the principles of verifiability, predictability, falsifiability, and fairness. So the application, um, so it says the application of the scientific theory to psychology took the discipline from a form of philosophy to a form of science. So many PhDs or doctoral thesis is really based around philosophy. Like you'll get a doctorate of philosophy in AI or artificial intelligence. It's it's not a, a complete area of study. I, learning never ends, but you'll come to see a lot of what is covered in AI is based on philosophy, not really concrete evidence-based science. So, so uh, critical thinking, of course, is a key component of the scientific method. If you, without critical thinking, you can't lose use logic to come to any kind of conclusion based on the scientific method. And that's a that's an extremely essential part of how we're able to do difficult things. 
And this is why having an education or getting education is important, but a specific type of education is even more important. And I'm gonna explain what that is um, very soon. So uh, all scientific disciplines are united by their use of the scientific method. That's every facet of science, especially in artificial intelligence, AI and machine learning. So uh, the scientific method offers an objective methodology for scientific experimentation uh, that results in unbiased interpretations of the world and refines uh, knowledge. The scientific method was first outlined by Sir Francis Bacon and allows for logical, rational problem solving across many scientific fields. Across all scientific disciplines, the major precepts of the scientific method are verifiability, predictability, falsibility, and, uh, uh, falsifiability, and fairness. So let me just reduce my... Let me just go here, reduce this a little bit further. Okay, so I'll make this bigger so you can all see. So the first step is through this process is you, is you make an observation. You see something in the natural world. You usually see it with your five senses, seeing, hearing, what have you, and you observe it. So you can observe something you smell, something you taste, something you touch, something you see, something even in psychology, something you feel even something you believe. So it could be any kind of observation based on your physical body, your property, five senses. Then you ask a question about what you observe. Um, is, uh, does water freeze at zero degrees Celsius or does it melt at zero degrees Celsius, right? And from that question, you form a hypothesis and you're gonna test it. You say, well, it's either it does or it doesn't. That's a binary situation and you form a hypothesis that answers a question. So of course, the question is asked, does water freeze at zero degrees? Well, you're gonna test that theory, right? So you're gonna make a prediction based on the hypothesis. So especially with machine learning, we try to make predictions all the time about different properties. And often that those properties are driven by data and the analysis of data, the collection of it, and then the analysis of it. We see an observation based on what the data shows us and then we use it to make predictions in the real world. But in this case, I'm talking about physical properties. So then we do an experiment to test the prediction. So in this case, we want to do an experiment that says, does water freeze at zero degrees Celsius? And then we're going to analyze our results. So if water does freeze at zero degrees Celsius and it is correct, then of course we can report the results to say, yay, we just proved our hypothesis um, that, you know, uh, we're going to make our prediction based on the hypothesis, you know, does water freeze at zero degrees Celsius? And it's a yes or no, so we verify the results. Now, if it was false and we realized that it didn't freeze at zero degrees Celsius water, then we would go back and we try it again. This time we do it at uh, zero minus uh, 0 0.5 degrees, or maybe we go to 0 0.5 degrees and observe the results and see what happened. So it is an iterative process. So the scientific method essentially is a process for gathering data and processing information. It provides well-defined steps to standardize how scientific knowledge is gathered through a logical, rational problem-solving method. And this is a, a great um, uh, representation of the scientific method. Here's a, another um, flowchart of the scientific question, asking, asking a question do background research. Uh, so you try to so you try to look at the problem space. Does somebody has somebody already observed this particular observation or problem? And then you try to look for the solution in the solution space. Well, maybe it has already been solved, or maybe that um, hypothesis has already been answered. So you want to invest some time and look at academic peer-reviewed scientific research. And now that everybody has the internet, we can do that very, very quickly to save us time and effort or help us verify our own experiments. So we construct a hypothesis out of that, the research, then we're going to test it with an experiment and we determine whether it works or not. And if it doesn't work, we just keep going through iterations. So we troubleshoot, check all steps. We try to verify the setup. Um, and, and the experiment, and then we try to observe it and see if we're getting the expected result or the prediction pre prediction that we want. So of course, at the end of it, we analyze data and draw conclusions. This is more of a data-driven um, 
experimentation process and do the results align with the hypothesis and then we communicate it and then are the results partially or not at all aligned with the hypothesis and then we repeat the process this would be very good process for uh, machine learning uh, data analysis and ai so um so basically to break it down making an observation is you can't study what you don't know is there in other words it's hard to study something that doesn't exist or hasn't revealed itself to you right so people who are generally curious will find these things or they'll use some kind of form of randomness or, or curiosity to try things that maybe they haven't done before. And that's a very important part of the process. Sometimes you'll try something and it doesn't work. So basically the scientific method is to fail a lot, to fail very, very often and keep going through that iterative process until you succeed, you get some success. Then once you have an observation, then you ask a question. So why is that particular thing the way it is, right? So once you find something interesting to study, then you need to ask a question and hopefully uh, th that can be answered. So it could be a question about anything that you observe. And then of course, you're gonna do your background research is to see if you can find the answer to your question you need to know. And then you know need to know what potential answers are. Sometimes you may find partial questions and sometimes you may find partial answers but it is up to you then to use some of those bits and pieces of information to create it or build an experiment so you can get a complete answer. Is this gonna work or not? Um, so uh, then the next part is after you do your background research is to form a hypothesis is what you think the answer to your question is. Of course, forming a hypothesis means that you have to have some amount of cognitive intellectual capacity in order to formulate a hypothesis and say, well, you know, based on what I know or based on what I researched in the background research, I expect my experiment to produce such and such a result. And you write down, down maybe one result down, or you may see three kind of conditions that you're going to test and see if one of those are, are true or not. And once you write down the test cases that you want to do, then you're going to conduct an experiment. Sometimes, uh, so the experiment is basically, how do you find an answer to your hypothesis? Of course you conduct the experiment. So designing a good experiment uh, is a whole industry that some scientists spend their whole career working on. Believe it or not, research scientists are those people. They, that's all they do is they do experiments in labs every day, 365 days a year if they could. But um, in some instances, especially with technology, we can run many iterations in a shorter period of time to draw rapid conclusions and once you draw your rapid conclusions or come up to your conclusions then you analyze the results and you come up with a conclusion it either works or it doesn't it either proves your hypothesis or it dispels your hypothesis entirely it's like oh, okay that that doesn't hold true it's not going to work and then once you uh, draw a logical rational reasonable conclusion based on your experiment and the results you achieved then you're going to report your results to uh, uh, a community or a body of professionals, like usually you publish in a journal, you write a scientific research paper, it has a particular format and, uh, and is constructed in a way that is able to easily communicate your hypothesis and your entire experiment, including the results on what you found. So um, let's see here. So how do we get here? How do we um, produce the kinds of people that become scientists? How do we produce curious people? How do we nurture and inspire uh, people to be curious, uh, especially in children, young boys, young girls, and even in adults? I think curiosity should never end. Something I've discovered in, in my research is the trivia method. And the trivia method is probably one of, it, it's, it goes very far back, way back into ancient times, way back into the, the Roman era and far beyond that. And the classic trivia model is based on three principles. And it does go a lot further than this, but I'm just gonna cover it at a high level. So it covers grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Those are the three core principles that any human being on the planet can use in order to um, conduct an experiment to, you know, produce a hypothesis based on some kind of observation of your five senses, conduct an experiment, 
and then come to a conclusion based on the experiment you conducted and the results. So here, for example, it covers elementary children at a younger age. They are adept at memorization, so they learn songs, rhymes, and recite facts with relative ease. So because children are so eager to memorize, they enjoy nonsensical rhymes. So it doesn't have to make sense. It just has to um, have easy recall, um, easy search, uh, easy recall for grammar. Grammar is also basically understanding what you read or what you understood based on what you observed. So it is your use of language. Um, are you able to um, read something and comprehend what you read? Um, was it clear to you? Did you understand exactly what all the conditions were? That's the very first step. Then the second step is logic. So it's really logic is being able to think for yourself is to use, um, so here it says, uh, think independently and often develop a propensity for argument. So it teaches people to think and analyze critically and to argue well by arranging facts into organized statements and arguments. So this is really the sort of the, um, the organization, the cognitive organization of all the grammar that you acquired. And then you can put it in a systematic way that you can make a, uh, a complete argument. In other words, your argument has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And your argument is either for or against that which you are arguing uh, against, right? Or arguing with. So it takes practice. It is an iterative process. But um, logic, um, not everybody I've come to find develops this skill in the same way, in the same type of domains. Um, so, and then of course, the last is rhetoric. So rhetoric is the art of communicating well. So here it says, once a student has obtained knowledge of the facts using grammar and developed the skills necessary to arrange those facts into organized arguments, which is logic, then the student develops a skill of effectively communicating those arguments to others through the use of rhetoric. So for example, a classic example of rhetoric is sales, is doing sales. So in sales, you formulate grammar and you may have some sales scripts that you use. And of course, you may face objections. You may have a particular sales goal and you will use a logical argument with your customer or client in order to help them achieve their goal so that way you can help yourself or your business achieve your goal. It is a mutually beneficial um, uh, conclusion where you achieve a win-win. And then the last part is by delivering your message for, for selling, you're basically using rhetoric. You're using the utterance of rhetoric or words or logic and reason to, uh, to sell a product or service. And that would basically be the use of rhetoric. So advertising, um, pitching is a form of the use of rhetoric to do that. So here's a really great website called triviumeducation.com. And this website goes much, much deeper into the actual trivium method. So of course, grammar one, formal logic two, and classical rhetoric. So the grammar pertains to the, let me just zoom in a little bit more here. So grammar pertains to the questions who, what, where, and when, and logic pertains to the why. So like the little five-year-old that keeps asking, so why? Why, why is that like that? Why, why does that, why does that do that? Why is that blah, 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 you know? These are children trying to use all of the grammar they acquired and then develop their own sense of understanding of the world using the logic, which is why question. Then if, after that, they use rhetoric is the how, and you see kids will enter this, just see children will enter this stage where they start to explain things to you. Like this is how that works, or this is, not only why something works, but how it does something. And it's really, really, it's a huge stage to see kids start doing that. So here is, um, here's a really great Webster's Dictionary um, excerpt about um, the, I guess this is more about, uh, let's see here. This is about the trivia method. So here it states, the liberal arts, uh, the higher arts, which among the Romans, only free men were permitted to pursue or in the Middle Ages, these seven branches of learning, grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. 
So uh, in modern times, the liberal arts included the sciences, philosophy, history, and so on, which compose the courses of academical or collegiate education, hence degrees in the arts, master and bachelor of arts, and so on. So basically, for what I know, in private school, this is what they teach children. They, they, you have to have a really good start. Now, it's never too late to learn the trivia method. Anybody can learn it at any age, but the younger you learn it is the more um, adept you'll be at navigating the world around you, understanding it, um, and being able to uh, have the world benefit you and vice versa. You'll be of tremendous value to someone by investing in uh, this type of understanding or education using grammar, logic, and rhetoric in order to master the world around you pretty much, including people and other many, many domains. So um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that. And uh, that basically covers the, um, the uh, uh, what is it? The, the power of, the real superpower of doing and achieving very difficult things at a very high level. This is what uh, I've come to learn many years ago about knowledge and education and why it's really, really important to set children up from um, a very early age to get a really, really good education. Um, it is extremely important to set them up for learning in an institution that promotes the trivia method because they will have all of the core foundational um, framework in order to navigate the world around them and to continue learning, also self-learning, learning on their own, um, uh, exploring the world around them, uh, maintaining their curiosity, and also to be better contributors to themselves and to their peers and to society uh, as a general. And this really goes for like healthy, mentally capable people. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it kind of has those kind of constraints, of course. But yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that blog and or vlog. And uh, I look forward to turning out another one. Thank you.